welcome to God's house as we come together to worship him this morning. Beautiful spring-like morning. We welcome you all here. We thank you for the visitors that are here this morning as well. Afterwards, we have a time of fellowship, and we ask that you stick around for that. Uh, we may get to know you better. Or we can continue to fellowship. It's a big part of the body of Christ. We begin our week together. Um, let's stand for our call to worship this morning. Comes to us responsibly, we praise you, O God, with an upright heart. Do not let us stray from your commandments. Blessed are you, Lord. With our lips we declare your ordinances. Our eyes are fixed on you, Lord, our Emmanuel. That's our prayer, and let's welcome each other into this house of worship. team this morning. We're going to be led by some young ladies who are going to lead us in worship. We're going to sing, Lord, I lift your name on high and build your kingdom. Thanks, gals, for doing that.
heaven, we come to you this morning, Lord, and we pray as you build your kingdom that we would be part of that building process. We would be part of the foundation. We would be part of the bricklaying, the rafters. We thank you, Lord, that we could worship you this morning in song, as well as in many different aspects of worship, hearing you speak to us through your word of giving our gifts, talking to you through prayer, just fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters in Christ. We pray, Lord, that every part of it would please you and honor you. So, Lord, build your kingdom. May this be a preparation of building it here this morning, we pray. As we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, girls. Thank you, Mary Ann. Appreciate that. It is the future church. Turn in our hymnals number 207. We'll remain seated in saying we have come to join in worship. Reminded in Romans chapter 3 that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. No one is exempt from sin. We live in a fallen world. But we have a way out. The way out is forgiveness through Jesus Christ. So let's go to God in a prayer of confession as a church body. Let's pray together. God of all history and eternity, whom we call upon even now, you are eternal, unchangeable, infinite and almighty. You are completely wise, just and good, the overflowing source of all goodness. We thank you for your covenant, which is never broken, and your love, which is never measurable. Mercy on us, O oh God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out our transgressions. Wash us thoroughly from our iniquities, and cleanse us from our sin. 
For we know our transgressions, and our sins are ever before us. Against you and you alone have we sinned, and done what is evil in your sight. Create in us a clean heart, O God, put a new and right spirit within us, cast us not away from your presence, and do not take away your Holy Spirit. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and sustain in us a willing spirit. Amen. God of heaven and earth, we thank you, God, that we can be guaranteed that our sins are forgiven. You give us a pretty strong promise that it's as far as the east is from the west, which is a distance of no beginning and no end. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that we are fellow travelers on the way to eternity. We have an invitation from our Savior. He tells us to come to him as he has a free gift. He says, come to me and receive eternal life with me. He will furnish all the essentials in our home in heaven. Father, in those invitations of come, there's a response. It's like a mother or father asks us to come to the table for dinner, for supper, for lunch. We can either respond or we can stay in our room. If we stay in our room and don't come, we therefore will grow hungry. This morning, Lord, you invited us to come. Come and be filled up in your house of worship. Come and build your kingdom in this place, in this community. Many have responded. We thank you for every beating heart here this morning, and we praise you, O oh God, that their passion was to worship you. And yet we know there are those who, who uh, couldn't be with us. We pray for them today, Lord. We pray for those who had no desire. Would you place in their heart a passion of hunger to be filled food, the spiritual food that you placed before us. We thank you for the beauty of spring. We thank you, Lord, for the moderate weather that we can experience as we go through the calving season. And we thank you, Lord, for new life, whether it's in sheep or calving or the green grass. Lord, it reminds us of what season is coming up, and that is Easter. The new life that you gave us as you conquered sin and death and hell, we praise you for that, O oh God. Reminds us of a spiritual aspect that every day is a new day. We live for that day, knowing that it comes from you as a gift. We pray, Lord, for our families who are hurting. Maybe it's our immediate family, maybe it's a distant family, someone on the block that we live on or in the same section, a neighborhood. Families who are stricken with a physical illness, an emotional illness pain that runs deep, maybe they're going through some distress, maybe financial distress, maybe a family distress, family separation, those who are wrestling with inner depressional pain. Father, we, we need you in so many ways. And Lord, help us not to just call on you when we're in need, but to thank you when life is on cruise control as well. We pray for those within our church body. We pray you would continue to restore Nan to complete health. Be with her and Keith as they have moved from us. Thank you so much for their presence among us. And now, Lord, will you use them in Sioux Falls in a real and powerful way. We also pray, Lord, that you continue to be with Don. As he recovers. Give him strength for each day. Be with Laverne. Pray, Father, that you would give grace in his impatience, his peace, and his unrest, knowing that their life is in your hand. Continue to watch over Ellie. Be with Harold and Leonard and Toby. Pray also that you'd continue to be with Mary Ann. We thank you, Lord, so much that 
she uses the gifts that you implanted in her life, gifted her with, music, and in so many different ways. We as a church body are the recipients, and for that we praise you, Lord. We pray for others too, Lord, who are gifted, gifted in greeting us this morning as we walked into your house, gifted in serving coffee, serving in the nursery, playing uh, musical instruments gifted in being a prayer warrior, or sending out those touching cards of encouragement in times of need. So many gifts, and yet they come directly from you. Some of us, Lord, have gifts that we've never explored. We think they're too minute. We think they're too unworthy to be used by you, and Father, let us never lose sight that the gifts that you place within us are God gifts. It might be as simple as opening the door at the grocery store. It might be as simple as encouraging someone to have a good day. Or it might be as simple as a smile. And usually you frown when that person is in sight. Use them gifts, Lord, in our life. Why? So we can build your kingdom this place. We also pray, Lord, for the family circle. We thank you for parents and grandparents, for young adults, young people, young children, young toddlers, babies, infants in the mother's womb. Thank you for this time of life, Lord, and when we see that go full circle, as little children were so dependent on our parents take care of us. Then we go through life and we make decisions and we explore and we move forward and then as we get into an elderly age, so often we go back to that place of birth. And again, we need help. Survive from day to day. Thank you, Lord, for the family that you ordained us. I thank you too, Lord, for Grandview Reformed. I pray, Lord, you would continue to bless this church family. Thank you, Lord, for the upcoming events of this church. We think especially of the Spring Carnival. It's such an opportunity for us to share the love of Jesus Christ in a real simple way, just enjoying and having fun to those around us as well. We pray, Lord, you continue to bless the council, the elders and deacons, with those who are in positions of teaching catechism or Sunday school or youth group, leading a Bible study. We give you praise, Lord, for their calling, and for them being obedient. Be with our nation, the unrest, the uproar, yet we know that you're still on the throne, be with President Trump, like President Pence. Pray, Father, that you would allow them, Lord, daily, call on them daily, Lord, to fall on their face before you and seek your way every aspect of their leadership position. Be with Governor Dugard, Lieutenant Governor Michael, and all those, Lord, who are in positions of leadership on a state level and on a county level. Lord, we thank you for them. And then we thank you, Lord, for the men and women today who are distant from their family. Maybe they're sitting in an airport working security, or maybe they're in another part of the world standing for the freedom that we have here this morning with our Bibles in front of us. We can sing to the top of our lungs and shout hallelujah or amen or whatever you place in our heart as a spirit of worship. And yet we are not harmed, we are not chastened, we are not persecuted for that. And yet, Father, we know that there are those across this world who are worshiping in secret, even this very hour. We have no recollection of that. We can't we can't even possess that, begin to think of that in our mind. Father, may your word go forth, even when there's people who persecute and bring down. Father, bless us as we continue our worship, as we open your word. Lord, would you speak to us? Would they be your words? Would they give us it's just a new passion of Lent? Why you came, why you rose, the instruction you gave your disciples, we're ready to ascend into heaven. 
Hear this prayer, Lord, we pray. And again, Lord, we ask that those words that the psalmist created in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Brooklyn Brower is now going to lead us in special music. The guitar, you singing, Brookie? sound of his voice seas that are shaken and stirred can be calmed and broken for my regard through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well for me to not believe even when my eyes can't see and this mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea through it all through it all my eyes are on you Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Brooks. Powerful, powerful words. It is well with my soul. Thanks for using your gifts. That God has blessed you with. Appreciate that very much. Let's turn in our hymnals to number 393 and ask God to breathe his spirit on us before we open his word. 393, we'll remain seated and sing, Breathe on me, breath of God. I invite you to turn with me this morning to the Gospel of John. You may be sent the wrong Gospel to Joanne. Gospel of John, chapter 14, not Luke. John, chapter 14. We're going to begin reading at verse 15, and we're going to read through the end of the chapter, through verse 31. John 14. Before we get, begin reading there, if you go to the beginning verses, we hear these quite often. We hear them quite often at a, at a visitation, a prayer service, a wake, a funeral. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you with me also. You may be where I am. You know the way to the place where I am going. And I'll stop there, and the disciples get confused. They just experienced what? They experienced Calvary. They experienced the empty tomb. And now this Jesus is talking about a mansion. And he's going somewhere. So what I want to try to look at this morning is the finished gift of Lent, of, of uh, Monday, Thursday, of Palm Sunday, of Good Friday, of of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so we begin reading at verse 15. Jesus says, If you love me, you will obey what I command, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. For long the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world. 
Jesus replied, If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me will not obey my teaching. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say I'm going away and I'm coming back to you. If you love me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father. For the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. But the world must learn that I love the Father, and that I do exactly what my Father has commanded me. Come now, let us leave. Here ends the reading. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, I have entitled my message this morning, The Finished Gift. And here is the finished gift. In verse 27, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I, you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. If you remember a month ago, the beginning of Lent, the first Sunday of Lent, um, do a little quiz, I won't remember it, I had to look back, but What did we look at as the theme of our Lenten season? What always brings us to the driving theme? It was we looked at forgiveness, did we not? When we look at the cross, when we look at the empty tomb, when we look at the thorns, it's about forgiveness. It's about forgiveness. Everything in this picture of Palm Sunday, of Monday, Thursday, of Good Friday, of the courtyard, of the tomb, of the empty tomb, symbolizes one powerful point in Scripture, and that is we are forgiven through Jesus Christ. Now that may be defined as the greatest gift of Calvary, but here this morning I want to fast forward, if you would. Fast forward to Jesus visiting with his disciples before he ascends into heaven. I ran across this as I was doing my devotions this week, not doing them, as I was enjoying my time with God this week. And it kind of stopped me in my tracks as I pondered and studied one of the true reasons that God did this for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And it's laid out in John 14. John 14 is interesting. After all the dust had settled of Jesus' death and resurrection, and Jesus appears to his disciples, there's a boatload of confusion going through their minds. Who is this? Where is he going? Didn't he just die? There's even fear in the beginning stages of John 14 where, where the disciples are wondering about this mansion. Who is it? Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Show us the way. Jesus answered, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's confusion. There's fear. They're afraid. There's troubled minds on how to get to this mansion that Jesus is going to. The disciples, we can sense, are in a spirit of, of uproar, of fear, of now what? But can you imagine for a moment what the disciples have just experienced? In the courtyard, in the temple scene, Jesus clearing the temple, in the mocking, in the brutal death, and the strange happening at the tomb, and and now this? And so what's some of Jesus' first instruction? After he's been through... Uh, Gethsemane, as after he's been through Calvary, after he's risen from the dead, after all the dust settles, what is God's gift? Peace. Peace. Peace I leave with you. Now that peace is an inner happening that we would love to capture. In fact, I would love to store it for a rainy day. 
for a troubled day. We all seek it. We all struggle with peace. And, and when we lose peace, what happens? We are exactly like the disciples. We're confused. We're afraid. We have lives of fear. We have lives of anger. We have lives of unsettlement. We say things like, let's just throw in the towel. We say things like, my life is falling apart. I'm at my wit's end. There's no peace. Now here is where it starts. You see, what Jesus is saying here is in order to have inner peace, you have to have peace with God. This was Jesus' mindset with the disciples after the resurrection. He knew their and our deepest need would be peace. To calm our fears in this chaotic world, to clear our minds in this fast-paced world, how do we rest our souls? How do we find peace in our culture? You know, that word has gotten pretty passive. What defines it in your life? What makes it easy for others to see that you are living a life of peace? We hear it said, I would just love peace of mind. What does that mean? Webster says peace is a state of quiet. Freedom from disturbance. Turn with me to Colossians 3, if you would. And I'm going to read verse 15. This might help us explain it. Colossians 3, verse 15. Paul says, Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart. Since as members of one body you were called to peace, and he goes on and says, and be thankful. What is Paul saying there? I want, I want to dissect this a minute because I think it will help you understand a little bit what, what God wants for us in Jesus Christ in this peace. When Paul says, let the peace of Christ, and then the next phrase, rule in your hearts, there's a Greek word for this type of of ruling that's only used once in Scripture, and it's right here. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. And when he says this, he's not saying some type, what our minds go, of dictator, of king, of a president, of chairman of the board. Not that type of ruler. No, when he uses the phrase, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, it relates to an official who ensures that the rules are followed. So let's take that. Come, stick with me. If we take that to our lives, if we take that to our souls, can you picture it with me? Within our lives, ruling in our hearts is the referee of <laughs> peace. The referee of peace. Ah, I'm full of fear. And here in the middle of it is the referee of what? The spirit of peace. If I start thinking of it that way, when the fear or the, or, or the anger or, or, or the unforgiveness or whatever's going on in my life, right in the middle of it is the referee of peace, the spirit of peace. holding things at bay. Wow. Jesus Christ is saying no matter how chaotic your life is right now, the peace of Jesus Christ has possession. We never change the possession arrow. You get every jump. You will always win. This pure spirit of peace is ruling in your life. That opens it up in my mind as to something healthy. 
That opens up the understanding of now I know why Jesus said that before he left this earth. My peace I leave with you. Romans 12, verse 18 says, If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. You see, peace is really hard to come by at times. Listen to these statistics. In the 3,100 years of, of recorded history, the world has been, pe- has been at peace for 286 of those 3,100 years. I don't know what percentage that is, but it's not great. 286 out of 3,100 years, the world has been at peace. But in those past 3,100 years, there have been 14,531 wars. And then listen to this. Accounting for 3 trillion... 640 million lives. And in this understand, in this, in this, in this information, they sent out a survey survey to, to, to Americans with all kinds of options that if that if you were asked if you could have one of your wildest dreams answered, what would it be? Be an NFL star. What would it be? couple answers, 38% of the people said to win the lottery. One percent said to have world peace. You ask where America's God is. You see, a majority of the time, most of the time, Peace can be defined in our lives by outward situations. If the corn isn't wilting, I have peace. If that calf is alive, I have peace. If my bonus has come through at work, I have peace. So often it's outward. But for a believer in Jesus Christ, it it has to be different. Because when God sent His Son into the world, and we see that every year at Christmas, What are the angels saying? Glory to God in the highest and on earth. Peace. Goodwill. Do you know what that means for you? For me? No, I don't have my finger on it yet either. But I'm encouraged this morning. You may say, yeah, but Brad, I'm going through a horrible family separation. My job, it's a mess. I just lost a loved one. My health is failing. You don't understand it, Brad. Oh, I'm bringing you back to John 14, 27. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you, and I do not give as the world gives. Oh, oh. there's a huge difference. You talk about winning the lottery. spiritual aspect. Jesus is saying, in other words, I don't give you peace according to what's going on out there. But within your heart and soul is a referee of peace. That's the peace I give. When a One of Peanuts' cartoons, Lucy says to Charlie Brown, I hate everything. I hate everybody. I hate the whole wide world. And Charlie Brown replies, but I thought you have inner peace. And Lucy says, I have inner peace, but I still have outer obnoxiousness. Understand this, not only do we find peace within our heart as a treasure, but so does Jesus Christ find that within us. And the question remains, if, we're, if, we're, if the world is filled with so many people that are desiring peace within their hearts, where is it? Why isn't everyone bubbling with peace and joy and 
freedom? Why isn't there peace in families? Why isn't there peace in, in, in the hearts of addicts and the strongholds that we go through? I just want peace, Jesus. Please bring peace. But do you know what the problem is? You and I want peace. But here's the issue. The problem is you and I want peace on my terms. Not on the terms of Jesus Christ. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, my peace I leave with you. If you become high in the corporation that you work in, my peace I leave with you if you're successful in the sport that you participate in. I have nothing to do with it. In fact, our, it even says that this peace will guard our heart. Paul said. We have to conclude God in everything. That's why there's unrest in our nation, in our world. There could be no other way. But revival starts with you and I. And this morning, if I came up here and I told your listening ear what you wanted to hear to be a winner, uh, from the world's standpoint, this church would deteriorate and weep. In fact, I can say it to this point. If this Word of God, when we look at it and we read it, and this morning we talk about peace, and, and we don't have peace within, and, and, and this Scripture passage kind of offends us, maybe rips us apart a little bit. If it doesn't do that, I would question your and my walk with God. You see, only the truth in Jesus Christ, Jesus begins by telling them, will set them free. In other words, everything we have to bring to the throne of Jesus Christ. We don't like including Him in everything, especially our sin, especially our hang-ups, especially our addictions. Try it once. I think I've shared this story before, but it goes along with it. There was a mountain climber who fell off a cliff, and he was hanging on a tree branch going down a huge canyon if he let go. And he was hollering, Help! Help! Is there anyone up there? And this deep voice came through the canyon. I will help you, my son. But first you must have faith and trust me. And so the man holding onto the branch said, All right, all right, I trust you. I believe you. And the voice in the canyon said, then let go of the branch. There was a long pause, and he said, is there anybody else up there? Isn't that textbook? To our lives? When there's unrest. When peace is distant. Oh yes, Jesus says in this world will be trouble, will be hardships, but take heart. Jesus tells us that he gives us peace that passes all understanding. There's a prayer that I'm sure many of you have heard before. It goes like this. God, grant me the serenity. In other words, grant me the peace to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. Just one thought before we close. You know, in our lives, it's not so much what's going on today that gives us unrest, gives us frustration, fear, anger. Usually it's the remorse of what happened yesterday. And the dread for tomorrow. 
live for today. Really, I mean that. Focus your mind today on Jesus Christ. Live today in the peace of Christ, knowing who's refereeing in the midst of your soul. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that as you went to the cross, as you rose from the grave, you said to your disciples, your followers, hey, I want, to know, I want you to know something. I did all this so you could have peace. Not peace according to the world. What it offers. But peace with Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you for them encouraging words. And when there's unrest in our souls, maybe we're thinking, oh man, what happened last, this past week on, on Thursday or Friday. Oh. And then this week, Wednesday, I got that huge test. Or I got, man, I got that appointment and I don't want to meet with that. Today's the gift. And in this day, we find our Savior, Jesus Christ. And in the midst of our hearts and souls, He rules. He's the referee. He's the official. He's the referee who always wins. Father, we thank you for that. Enlighten our souls. Help us to understand this finished gift for all. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me, please? Let's confess our faith. In the words of the Apostles' Creed, let's say together, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and we praise God. We show our peace by giving our morning offering.
midst of Lord of our of our obnoxiousness of this world around us, we pause, Lord. The beginning song, one of the beginning songs we sang this morning, "Build Your Kingdom Here." It takes all of us, Lord. It takes all of us as prayer warriors. It takes all of us as willing servants. And it takes all of us in giving our gifts. So, Lord, we pray that your kingdom would be spring up among the lives of individuals, whether here or abroad, that your word would go forth, that people would experience true peace. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing hymn is 753, Jesus is coming again. Let's sing the first and the last, one and three of 753. 